I'll just give a summary of Ambassador Roy's qualifications, and uh, if I went through all of them, we would be here for the rest of the afternoon. So hopefully, as I go through even half of them, the folks uh, will be coming back into the room. Uh, ambassador Roy, uh, Stapleton Roy, uh, is, was ambassador to China from 1991 to 1995, and we're very pleased to say he is also a trustee uh, of the Carnegie Endowment here. Uh, he retired from Foreign Service in 2001. Uh, his career spanned 45 years uh, for, in the State Department. He was recently uh, joined on the board of Carnegie Endowment by another ambassador to China, John, John Huntsman. So uh, it indicates the commitment that uh, this institution has to this very special relationship between China and the United States. Uh, Ambassador Roy speaks fluent Chinese, uh, and I believe he's studied Mongolian and Russian as well, uh, and um, which is also a, a derivative of his his broad uh, service. Uh, uh, it's understandable he speaks uh, fluent Chinese because he was born in Nanjing, China, uh, as the, the son of American missionary parents. So his. Uh, his commitment to, to, to China and our, this relationship is, has been lifelong. Uh, ambassador Roy has earned his uh, title as an ambassador three times over. He has also served as ambassador to Singapore and to Indonesia. Actually, he has earned it four times over since he was promoted to the rank of career ambassador in 1996, the highest rank uh, in the Foreign Service. Among other board duties, he also serves as vice chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and is on the board of the Asia Foundation, among many others, several of them relating to U.S. and China activities. And to keep from being bored in all these activities, he also serves as managing director of the Kissinger Associates, which is a strategic consulting firm. With these credentials, uh, Ambassador Roy can speak on virtually any subject he wants, but he has agreed to share some views with us today on a possible U.S.-China strategic framework for clean energy cooperation. Ambassador Roy. Thank you for that nice introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. One of the cardinal rules of public speaking is to never address an audience on a topic where they know more about the subject than you do. <laughs> For that reason, I'm going to suppress my inclination to burden you with my views on the coal value chain and instead try to provide a sense of why the topic of this conference is important to U.S.-China relations. I think all of you here are aware of the fact that both in China and the United States, uh, we are well along in the process of selecting the leaders who will uh, lead our respective countries, in our case for the next four years, and in China's case for the next five to ten years. President Obama's nominees for the State Department, the Defense Department, and the Treasury Department key departments in managing U.S.-China relations have now been confirmed, but we don't know uh, how they're going to staff key positions in their departments, so we haven't completed the process yet. And in China's case, the National People's Congress, of course, is in session, and everybody's waiting to see exactly how China's government will be both restructured and repopulated uh, for the period ahead. Once this process is completed, the disturbing thing, in some ways, is that the roster of really troubling domestic and foreign policy issues is very long, and the domestic problems are sufficiently troubling that many people think top leaders are going to spend the lion's share of their time working on domestic issues rather than on foreign policy uh, issues. Now, obviously... Both issues need to be addressed, and neither can afford to be neglected. But if the domestic issues preoccupy the attention of the top leaders, we are heading for trouble. 
because both President Obama and President Xi Jinping, who's not yet president but will be shortly, will pay a heavy price if they fail to address the urgent foreign policy task of trying to halt the drift toward growing strategic rivalry in the bilateral relationship. If this issue isn't properly addressed, it will become more difficult, indeed dangerously so, to maintain the climate of peace and prosperity that has been so important in fostering China's rapid rise and in producing the East Asian economic miracle over the last 30 years. Now, as various commentators are pointing out, it's true that China and the United States are locked in the historic problem of a rising power challenging an established power. Historical precedents regarding these types of relationships are gloomy. Professor Graham Allison at Harvard has estimated that war has been the result in 11 out of the 15 cases in which you've had this circumstance since 1500. In other words, over the last uh, little over 500 years. So the odds, in a sense, are against the United States and China being able to handle this problem successfully. The good side is that leaders in both countries are aware of the historical precedents and have made it clear that they are determined to not let history repeat itself. China's new top leader, Xi Jinping, in a speech here in Washington and in other remarks, has talked about the necessity of creating a new type of great power relationship that can deal with this type of an issue. Uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, has also picked up on this theme, and she has talked about the importance of finding a new answer to this ancient question by building a model in which we strike a mutually satisfactory balance between competition and cooperation in the bilateral relationship. The state counselor in charge of foreign affairs in China, uh, Dai Bingguo, has also uh, used very similar language in addressing the question. He's proposed that China and the United States build a new type of great power relationship, again, borrowing language from Xi Jinping, and it should balance cooperation and competition in order to avoid what he calls the ironclad law of history that drives rising powers and established powers uh, into war, hot or cold alike. That's using his phrase. So it would seem that top policy leaders in both countries have set a framework for trying to prevent China and the United States from moving toward competition and possibly conflict. And yet the reality is that neither country has begun seriously to address the question of how you create this new type of leadership and how you integrate all the elements necessary in order to keep history from repeating itself. So we're getting nice rhetoric, and we're not getting the type of leadership we need in order to address this problem effectively. We can't even say for sure that this is an attainable goal. But if you don't explore it, then in a sense, you're letting history drive relationships instead of leadership. And we've seen, I can cite a host of examples where leadership has made all of the difference in altering the course of history. So in essence, that's what we're talking about in this case. Now, this is not an idle exercise in political science or an academic problem in an international relations class. We can already see the potential consequences in the unconstrained rivalry between our two military establishments in the Western Pacific. Specialists in U.S.-China relationship in the U.S.-China relationship in both countries are gloomily reaching the conclusion that competitive factors now outweigh cooperative factors in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. Now, I'll touch on this again a bit later. I don't agree with that proposition. I think the cooperative aspects are still the dominant factor in the relationship. But getting this balance right is critically important. Again, there are good grounds for concern about this. Let's compare East Asia versus the Middle East. In the Middle East, President Obama is winding down the U.S. military involvement 
in Afghanistan. At the same time, he's been under pressure in recent years to get militarily involved in Libya, and he's now under pressure to do something intervention-wise in the case of Syria. Lurking in the background is the potential for military action against Iran if it stubbornly persists in its nuclear program. But no matter how you look at these issues, and everybody recognizes that U.S. renewed intervention in the Middle East in a military way would create a host of really troublesome problems, but they don't involve the risk of great power confrontation. In East Asia, the situation is different. In the East and South China Seas, China is locked in a web of disputes with its neighbors over conflicting territorial claims involving small islands that most people can't find on the map. The United States takes no position on these territorial claims, but two of the conflicting parties, Japan and the Philippines, have mutual defense agreements with the United States and are allies of the United States. The United States takes no position, as I mentioned, on the territorial claims, but ever since the Okinawa reversion in 1971-72, we have recognized Japanese administrative jurisdiction over the islands because we ourselves, when we were the government in Japan, exercised administrative jurisdiction over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. The U.S.-Japan Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security covers an armed attack against either party in the territories under the administration of Japan. China is now in the process of aggressively challenging Japanese administrative jurisdiction over the disputed islands by regularly sending vessels and aircraft into the territorial waters surrounding the islands. In the case of the Philippines, the United States does not recognize Philippine sovereignty over the disputed islands, but we have a mutual defense treaty that applies if there is an attack on a Philippine ship or aircraft anywhere in the Pacific. I'm quoting from the mutual defense agreement. So the United States finds itself in the awkward position of trying to reassure our allies that we're a good friend and ally while we're trying to restrain their behavior because the United States does not see its interests served by being dragged into a potential conflict with China because of differences over small and, in the U.S. eyes, relatively unimportant islands in the Western Pacific. But the difference between East Asia and Middle East is in East Asia, the issue involves potential great power confrontation, whether it's Japan and China or whether it's China, Japan, and the United States. So the risks in East Asia are higher than they are anywhere else in the world because nowhere else in the world do you have a similar potential for great power confrontation. Now, there's a, an additional problem that has emerged. Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos care about these islands. They're involved in territorial issues. Americans don't care about them. As I said, most Americans can't find the islands on the map. Well, this is reflected in what's happening to the U.S.-China relationship. Polls in China, including by the highly respected Pew Global Attitudes Survey, have found that the percentage of Chinese who characterize their country's relationship with the United States as one of cooperation has plummeted from 68% to 39% just in the last two years. 26% of Chinese polled characterize the relationship of, of one of hostility up from 8% just two years ago. A parallel Chinese poll of mainland attitudes, looking at both public and elite attitudes, found that the Chinese government officials, when asked whether the United States is China's partner, competitor, or enemy, 27% chose enemy, while 68% chose competitor. Now let's look at the U.S. side, because a similar poll using the same questions was done in the United States. And when U.S. government officials 
were asked whether China was a partner, competitor, or enemy, only 2% of government, U.S. government officials think of China as an enemy, while 80% called China a competitor. So these island disputes are having a very different impact on the bilateral relationship in each country. And that makes management of this relationship much more difficult. Now, what does this have to do with the coal value chain? The answer is a good deal. <laughs> it will be impossible to build the new type of great power relationship between the United States and China that both sides, at least at the rhetorical level, are exploring if they're not able to find ways to strengthen cooperative elements in the relationship and moderate the competitive elements. Climate change and environmental concerns offer a rich field for expanded cooperation between China and the United States. This was recognized at the very beginning of the relationship, of the formal diplomatic relationship back in 1979. Indeed, a bilateral science and technology agreement was one of the first three agreements signed by Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping and President Carter back in late January, early February 1979 uh, during Deng's visit to the United States. The other two were a cultural agreement, an agreement permitting each side to open two consulates general in the other country. It actually fell to me to negotiate the science and technology agreement. And I, of course, was very insistent on including the coal value chain uh, within the parameters of the agreement. I had, had to handle the issue because Leonard Woodcock, who was the head of the liaison office at the time, was back in Washington preparing for the visit by Deng Xiaoping and to get himself confirmed as the first United States ambassador to the People's Republic of China. We were under extraordinary time pressures to get these agreements negotiated because Deng was just about to depart for the United States and we had to have the completed text ready. And this made my job much easier because in contrast to many other situations I have encountered, I was able to get almost instantaneous reactions from Washington and from the Chinese government when there were issues that we had to resolve in the, uh, uh, in the negotiating process. This path-breaking S&T agreement became the framework for the subsequent conclusion of 19 cooperative agreements on energy between the United States and China, covering such fields as fossil energy, climate change, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. Much has been accomplished over the last 34 years, but as recent pictures have dramatically demonstrated, Beijing and other major Chinese cities are still afflicted with health-threatening levels of air pollution. And that leaves aside the water pollution, the earth pollution, and the other issues that some of you may have been already discussing here at the conference. In other words, there is an enormous scope for expanded cooperation between the United States and China in multiple fields related to clean energy. Let me briefly mention some of the areas where cooperation has been taking place. At the governmental level, President Obama and President Hu Jintao signed nine clean energy agreements in 2009. And one of these was focused on cooperation in the field of renewable energy, which is a very high priority issue in China. The US Environmental Protection Agency has been working with China's Ministry of Environmental Protection to strengthen the use of sulfur dioxide scrubbers and nitrogen oxide removal equipment on coal plants and factories, uh, coal-fired power plants and factories. EPA and U.S. non-governmental organizations have been working with China to expand the use of low-sulfur fuels and emission systems for vehicles. U.S. national laboratories, NGOs, and foundations have been intensively working with Chinese policymakers and research institutes to provide assistance in designing China's energy efficiency and renewable energy standards, together with associated regulations and laws and policies, excuse me. EPA's Air Office has been working with China's Ministry of Environmental Protection on regional air quality control plans and regulations 
The Natural Resources Defense Council has been working in China for over 15 years on energy efficiency, green buildings, clean energy technologies, environmental law, and green supply chain issues. U.S. NGOs are working with Chinese provinces on climate change planning and low-carbon cities. Now, impressive as these achievements are, they're a mere drop in the bucket in terms of what needs to be done. These examples illustrate why, in my view, pessimists about the outlook for U.S.-China relations are too prone to emphasize the problem areas while ignoring or downplaying the areas where mutually beneficial cooperation is taking place and can be expanded. We're all familiar with the litany of trade issues that have plagued the U.S. bilateral relationship with China. But stop and think for a moment. Trade is the most basic form of cooperation. And U.S.-China total trade now is running at a $500 billion figure every year. This is over 100 times greater than our maximum trade level achieved with the Soviet Union back in, 1949, in 1979, which was a mere $4.5 billion. So in other words, our relationship with China, the cooperation on trade, has reached a level that absolutely dwarfs what we were doing with the Soviet Union. And it's also significant that the level of our bilateral trade with China is two to four times larger than the total size of China's defense budget which gets a lot of attention in our press. Depending on whether you accept the official Chinese figure, which is around $116 billion, or you take some of the outside estimates, which put it as high as $190 billion. But both of those figures are much smaller than the $500 billion plus in the trade area. Viewed in this context, this conference is making a significant contribution to better understanding of an area where expanded U.S.-China cooperation is both timely and necessary. If you want to keep history from repeating itself, the point I'm making is you have to work hard to expand cooperation where it can and should take place, and you have to, at the same time, find ways to constrain the competitive factors that will always be present in the relation between two great powers, such as China and the United States. By realizing possibilities in this area, both sides can contribute to maintaining a healthy balance between competition and cooperation in the relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, talk about raising the stakes. I guess we're going to have to have a really good report <laughs> uh, from this conference. So. Uh, We've got a lot of work to do, Kevin and, and, and Lin Wa, Mr. Ma, Dr. Ma. So uh, uh, very pleased to have those remarks. Very good, uh, very thoughtful and on point. And uh, Ambassador Roy has agreed to take some questions. And uh, let's go right here first. Uh, thanks, Ambassador. Very thank you for your, taking your time to come here to share your thoughts. And for all of us who care about health development in China, U.S. relationship, we are all delighted that there is such a knowledgeable person like you in the D.C. areas, which will really help U.S. government and to put this Chinese in the right context. And we also very thank you for you serve the chairman of Asia Pacific Council, which we know U.S. ambassador, and to the Asia Pacific, which my former employee, East West Center, acted as the secretary. My specific question to you is the following. In your speech, you mentioned some kind of pull to say that uh, in the U.S., there was very government officials, there's a very small percentage considered China's enemy and a large percentage considered as a competitor. On the other hand, on China's side, there was quite a big percentage of Chinese officials considered U.S. as uh, enemies. I would take this very cautious because this is a you know, it's also from Singapore, but probably um, Chinese official think competitor and enemy in very different meaning compared with American do. Because probably Chinese government officials say that, you know, the U.S., you know, frankly, comments or intervene all these China issues. 
and officials thought, oh, this is probably enemies. You know, so that's the reason that, uh, but the U.S. probably consider this not, not really enemy issues. The reason I see this is uh, I also read the different report to see how general average people, Chinese Americans, think about others. You will find that 40%, over 40% U.S. people consider China is the largest economy in the world. And more than 60% American people consider China as enemies. I, given U.S. particular, you know, senator, congressman who is elected from state, actually I'm more concerned about how general American people think about China. So I would be very, very delighted and how people like you and you know, speak around the U.S. trying to how let the American general people have better understanding about China, and that will help American people general perception about China. Thank you very much. How can government, public officials, encourage Americans not to see China as an enemy? Is that your question? <laughs> I mean, that seems to be the question, right? Well, let me uh, first of all, I accept your point. In fact, I believe strongly that one has to take polls uh, very carefully. Uh, I am interested in as many polls as possible because it helps you to get a sense of in what direction the wind is flowing. But I will confess that I was shocked as somebody who goes to China all the time to find that polls were showing that over a quarter of Chinese, including at the government official level, were seeing the United States as an enemy. And it wouldn't be because of trade disputes. The heart of the reason is that China, for historical reasons, is extremely sensitive about challenges to its territorial integrity. And these issues, these little islands, all involve that problem for China. And China sees the United States, one, incorrectly, as stirring up the problems, which we are not doing, but secondly, as supporting the other side in the dispute. And one can understand that because, as I mentioned, we have, we're allies of some of the disputants, although we're trying to restrain them, as I mentioned. So that's, I think, the reason why the hostile element in the way Chinese are responding to this is coming out so strongly. Now, whether it's a quarter or whether it's smaller than that, I don't know. I think we'll have to watch this. But the fact is that two years ago, only 8% of Chinese saw the, uh, in polls, saw the United States as an enemy. So it's that trend that I find troubling because it's not understood by the Americans. We still tend to see China, A, as a, as a cooperator or a partner with about a fifth of Americans thinking that way, and the vast bulk of Americans think that China is a competitor. One of the interesting things is, I mentioned that 2% of the U.S. government officials saw China as an enemy. Of all of the categories of elite, media, uh, experts, retired military, etc., that was the highest figure. So in other words, Americans just do not see China as an enemy, despite the problems between the two countries, but a growing number of Chinese are seeing America as an enemy. That's a troublesome problem, and our top leaders need to be aware of it but you don't see it talked about much in the press. And that's what I'm concerned about. I've got a question, and, and this relates to our earlier conversation, Ambassador. This was, you made the, the uh, in our private conversation, that we aren't collaborator, collaborators and uh, cooperators in, in the real sense, but we're kind of like England and France, uh, which they are all parts of the EU, but they are not exactly cooperators. But we don't have an entity between China and the U.S. that is similar to the EU. We don't have that mm -hmm. uh, that 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 forum to to collaborate, and so therefore we either have to be directly confronted, or you know maybe it's the UN. Is there is there a way to, to have a way to be both collaborative and competitive in some sort of structure uh, in that in that region? Yes. I mean, I think that's the nature of our relations with virtually every country in the world. There's, there's a balance of, of, of uh, cooperation and competition. Europe, which most Americans think of, you know, as a close friend of the United States, is highly competitive with us in areas of trade and investment. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with having a, a balance between those two. The question is whether the dominant elements are the ones that are most conducive to advancing your own 
interests. The point I was making that you just referred to is I don't like the term G2 with respect to the United States and China because G2 organizations are rule-setting bodies. They try to set the standards by which other countries should behave. And there is no support in the world for having the United States and China setting the rules for everybody else. But in the EU, nothing gets done if France and Germany aren't able to cooperate together. But there are lots of other big powers in the EU, Italy, uh, Brit uh, Britain, uh, Spain, uh, you name them. And nobody talks about France and Germany as being a G2 in the EU. Now, there's no EU globally, if you will, but there is the United Nations, and we in China cooperate, as we've just seen with respect to North Korea. We have been cooperating in the, uh, in the uh, UN Security Council, and we compete in some issues. For example, on Syria, we don't have identical issues on how to ad address it. But take an issue like uh, climate change. China and the United States are the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases in the world, and if we don't cooperate together, nothing will get done of significance on climate change. So this is an example where we and China are like France and Germany in the EU. Either we cooperate or nothing gets done. And that's not a G2 relationship. You see, that's why I think the whole G2 concept was flawed from the very beginning, because it suggested that somehow you could have a world where China and the United States would become the hegemonic powers uh, uh, dictating to everybody else, we don't want it to be that way. China doesn't want it to be that way. Mm -hmm. It seems that, I mean, the, 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 the structure seems to be the, the COP conferences on climate change, but um, we tend to be competitors in that process, too, because nothing is going to happen in that process if we don't collaborate, and we don't collaborate. Ma'am, you had a question? Oh, hi. Yeah, and let's go. I saw, no, your I name, saw please? The, for, uh, it's a little bit unfair for the United States to bear the consequence which is Japan stood up for the DOE Island. We, at, uh, now, at this moment, the Japanese government still not acknowledge that disputed uh, sovereignty part. They, they it's true, they have the, the administrative power, but they don't have the real like sovereignty power. They must uh, ad, uh, admit that is disputed. That's the one question. Is there any, you know, you know, U.S. government can push it, both sit down and discuss the, this issue to uh, reduce the tense between the military conflict tense in the East Asia? I think that that's very important. Also, how to define the new type of the great power relationships? Do you think uh, our conference can send a message to both governments to see uh, you know, by import and export, which U.S. have uh, abandoned the core uh, resource. China need uh, like a core, my, uh, core resource by, like you said, the doing the corporations to improve the kind of the small but the belong to the new type of the great power relationships. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Japan-China dispute over the uh, uh, Senkaku Diaoyu uh, Dao issue. Uh, the United States has extensive relationships with both countries, obviously. But Japan and China, unlike China and the Philippines, where the question of reliable channels of communication uh, was in question at the height of the dispute uh, in May of last year. China and Japan have extremely good channels of, of uh, communication. Uh, as a result, they don't need a third party intermediary in order for them to work together on the question. The United States does have some input on this. And what I was trying to make clear is the US input is lower tensions. That's our interest in the matter. But how to do that involves passions on each side about territorial issues. And that's a difficult issue for third parties to come in and say, this is the way you should do it or not do it. Uh, I personally believe that Deng Xiaoping had the right approach, which is 
you don't let little issues like that get in the way of the bigger things. And therefore, you try to shelve these issues and let future generations deal with it. Now, if Japan won't recognize that there's a problem, it's more difficult to shelve it. But the fact of the matter is, it is not appropriate to have a high level of tensions that could involve military conflict over islands that have been unpopulated forever. Because Japan, when it controlled the islands, tried to settle people on them and failed. They don't have any water. They don't have any conditions for living on them. Their principal importance, and this reflected in the Chinese name for them, is the fishery resources around the islands. That's what it is. There may be some hydrocarbon resources, but they're not in sufficient quantities to warrant having this level of tension. So this is a question where wiser minds, and China has plenty of wise minds, and so does Japan, have to realize that they're going in the wrong direction at the moment, and they have to find some way to reestablish a modus vivendi so that they can focus on important issues and not let this issue become a dominating feature in their bilateral relationship. Now, the other side of your, the second part of your question. Import, export, oh, coal. The United, well, I haven't been here throughout this entire uh, uh, program, but I think that there, either this morning or later this afternoon, there's going to be discussion of the issue of energy policy. Uh, I don't think U.S. energy policy uh, is as wise as it could be. We are hung up in virtually every area involving energy over whether we should permit our resources to be exported or whether we want to protect our resources. We talk about energy security. We want to be 100% energy independent. Uh, this is absurd in an inter inter interdependent world. I mean, essentially, you only need to be independent, if you will, under wartime situations where you lose access to other sources of supply. Normally, you should let the international marketplace work uh, the way it's designed to do, in which case you get higher efficiencies in terms of how resources are used. U.S. energy policy is not driven by those factors. It's driven by special interests, by and large, and that creates lots of hang-ups. And we're right in the middle now that we're in surplus natural gas over the question of whether we should be permitted to export natural gas. Uh, so this is a big problem, and I think the United States needs a good energy policy, and I don't think we have one yet. One last question, Daddy. Uh, uh, thank you, Ambassador. It's a very, very good uh, presentation, and I fully agree with that. <clears throat> the 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 relation between the China and the U.S. is so important and it should not be broken uh, forever uh, to keep it uh, in peace and friendly cooperation. It's uh, very important for both sides. No problem for that. Uh, but as uh, you mentioned, it's uh, now the the East Asia or the uh, becomes a more. Uh, dangerous as uh, the so-called the big political body will be in conflict. That is, uh, mm, I have uh, some comments and maybe questions. Uh, How about the question, Daddy? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> uh, <coughs> the the comments is that you know is uh, uh, I we understand that because you have the, the agreement with Japan or with the Philippines that uh, Japan you will be fighted with others so yours. You have to stand on the Japan side. Uh, so we understand that, but this is a very important agreement. But uh, in Chinese philosophy, we need to find if Japan's stance is correct or not. If your support is correcting or is not a correcting, so that's a very important for peace for peacekeeping. Uh, you know, in my understanding, is uh, why the Japan has right now, so-called administrative uh, rights on the Diaoyu Island, because we did have some period during the early 1950s. So in that case, the island that had already been given back to China was given to Japan. So, of course, 
Deng Xiaoping is a very smart, and he said small things should not stop big things happen. So he said we we put it for longer time. Maybe the future generation is more smart than us. But the problem is that Japan don't want to do that. They want to make that kinds of mistake becomes we have to swallow. So how Question, can Jap- Daddy, how, can how, how can the Chinese to swallow that? So I think it's a very important fact. So uh, in my understanding, uh, as a, as a Philippine, yes, uh, many decades Philippines have no oppose that the, the, the Huangyan Island is Chinese territory, but but now. They certainly say, okay, it's our territory, we have to fight with that. So if we cannot stop that kind of action, that there's a, some two some kinds becomes a two have two. China has to protect their rights. And the uh, American has to be back for the mistake of Japan and the Philippines. So how can we solve that? It's a big hmm. philosophy problem. Thank you. You can respond to that? Or that's a comment, it's not a question. I am not the International Court of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't adjudicate between the Chinese and the Japanese claims or the Chinese and the Philippine claims. The United States position is we don't take a position on the sovereignty issues which have to be resolved in, uh, 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 elsewhere. But if you look at the record, what you find is in the case of the Senkaku Daoyu Islands, they are so unimportant that the record of both Japan and China on the islands are inconsistent. For example, Japan says they were unoccupied territory, and therefore when Japan took them over in January of, 19, of 1895, that they were simply taking up empty territory. But the proposal to take them over had been made 10 years earlier, And the Japanese foreign minister had expressed concern that the Qing dynasty might raise questions if Japan took them over, so Japan delayed for 10 years before it took them over in the middle of the Sino-Japanese War, not as a result of the settlement, but while the war was going on. So to say that they were unoccupied or uh, territory nullius or whatever the Latin term is uh, does not reflect the fact that Japan knew that there was a Chinese interest in the islands. During the 1950s, China's official media referred to the Diaoyu Islands as part of China, as part of Japan, excuse me. It was only in the 1960s, after resource issues were discovered potentially around the islands, that Japan began, uh, China began to reassert its claim. So there's an inconsistency here. You can point, in other words, to behavior by the Chinese and behavior by the Japanese that is not consistent with the line that they're putting forward. And the reason is these islands were so unimportant that neither government was paying sufficient attention to them to have a consistent record right down the way. This is the background against which you should ask yourself, how far do you want to let tensions rise over this type of an issue? That's the point I was trying to make. And with that, we will get back to the coal value chain. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>